Okay, yeah. let's do it. You guys ready? Yeah. Woohoo! Triple for reproductive rights. Big round of applause. Yeah. Amazing. Cool. Anyways, we're super happy to be here, and obviously, thank you to all of the amazing sponsors of this event. Uh, obviously, it's really fun to reconnect with the Drupal community, and uh, yeah, I want to start off with maybe a, <laughs> a question we hear a lot. You can all say it with me. What came first, the chicken or the... For us, it's the Drupal, and because we're here at a Drupal event, we know that oftentimes Drupal is always the answer, which is great. Uh, we know Drupal is amazing, it's flexible, it's powerful, it lets us do incredible things. I think that's why most of us are here today at this session as well. Uh, at the same time, I don't know uh, exactly uh, your line of work, but sometimes it's a bit of a risky strategy to start with the answer. And sometimes you want to take a couple of steps back and say, well, what is the question? What is the problem we're trying to solve? What are the needs? What are the requirements? What's the difference between a need and a requirement? Essentially, how do we know that Drupal should be the answer? But um, before we get too existential, we can also introduce ourselves to start. So uh, I'll let us Simon. Yeah, everyone, I'm Simon. I'm the director of technology for Adulting Web. I've been there around four, four years already. I mean, director of technology means not that I'm directing technology, but like the one to blame for any technological <laughs> decisions, basically. Uh, I mean, just a, I'm going to show you the probably all logo slide, and that's kind of such just evolving way for doing development and design on Drupal and WordPress uh, projects, mostly public sectors, uh, client, higher head, healthcare, both in Canada and, and, and the US. We are headquartered in Montreal, but we're from all that company. And it's a pleasure to be to have Adrian with me uh, for that, that session today. Yeah, so I work as a strategist with Evolving Web, so my specialty is asking those questions and trying to figure out, okay, this person said this and this person wants this, and what exactly are we trying to really do here? What are the priorities? And how can we really get everybody on the same page so that we get to maybe Drupal, but maybe other things as well? And as Simon said, Evolving Web uh, really specializes in open source. And uh, our goal essentially is to set projects up for success by making sure that our discovery is robust and we're not really starting too quickly with the answer, or at least making sure that uh, that answer is uh, justified. Uh, yeah, so to get back into some existential questions, um, as I'm sure most of you know, we're currently in a bit of a war for uh, reproductive rights in the U.S. and uh, we're fortunate enough, uh, <laughs> an accident of immigration uh, for both me and Simone to uh, be based in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, at the same time, for us, Planned Parenthood is obviously uh, a really a mission-focused organization that uh, again, in this day and age it's uh, more important than ever that the critical work that they're doing uh, can, uh, can go forward. So obviously, as we see, uh, their work around advocacy, really mobilizing citizens to fight for our fundamental rights uh, is essential. Uh, but in addition to advocacy, as I think most of us in the Drupal community know, advocacy is one thing, but it's also about providing services. And uh, in this context, depending on what state you live in, you may not have access to essential healthcare services and you're gonna make those choices about, uh, yeah, about your body. So uh, in addition to their advocacy work, Planned Parenthood also has a spin-off company called Planned Parenthood Direct. And their goal was really to put uh, those healthcare decisions uh, directly in the hands of our citizens and make sure that, again, if you're living in one of those 42 states where these services are still legal, you can get uh, birth control, contraceptive, antibiotic treatments delivered uh, directly to you discreetly, uh, no need to go into a health clinic and talk to a doctor, have a virtual consultation, and ensure that, again, there are as few barriers as possible to getting health care. So for us, it was a really great uh, match in terms of a project and a client. And uh, as you can see, uh, they did launch, uh, I think last year, the Planned Parenthood Direct app, which offers uh, multiple services, again, depending on where you live. But we're sort of also targeting that younger demographic. Maybe they don't have uh, primary health care uh, uh, providers. Maybe they're, again, in a state or close by states where access to health care is just not accessible because it's too far away. Or, again, they're just the generation that's very online. It's really easy to have an app on your phone where I can know that my contraceptive is going to be automatically renewed with a credit card and mailed to me, no more questions asked. 
Uh, so just to put of a sort of set the scene for uh, what we're going to do here. And uh, we started with Discovery and it started off with a bang. We uh, were fortunate or unfortunate enough to have a client who was Team Drupal. They really came to us already convinced of uh, not only their technological stack, but also um, other uh, ideas about what the site should look like, how it should be configured. Basically, they were like off to the races, and we were sort of uh, strapped in in the sidecar. We had our goggles on, and uh, we were along for the ride. Um, at the same time, uh, for us, again, Drupal is necess not necessarily always the answer. So it was important for us to also sort of get in there in that discovery process, make sure we're not putting the proverbial horse before the cart, and uh, really think a bit more about, uh, again, who are your users, what are they trying to do, what's important for you. And essentially, the goal was to build a marketing website uh, that would really just give them enough information to make sure is this service going to be right for me? Is it going to be available in the state? How does it work? Am I confident enough that I'm gonna actually leave the website and just download the app? So again, it wasn't something we're looking at uh, engagement or time spent on the site. It was really a site intended to convert users, but make sure that they were doing it in a way that wouldn't make them frustrated afterwards. Oh crap, I downloaded the app, but finally I can't even get the service because I'm not in the right state. Uh, so for us, it really allowed us to sort of uh, take a couple of steps back and uh, make sure that we were investing in, tech, uh, in discovery and uh, ensuring that both our strategy and our design were then going to guide the technological choices and not uh, vice versa. Uh, so essentially, uh, when the client arrived, they really uh, came to us with an information architecture and a site map and uh, a technological, we should configure it like this and this is what we want to use. They even put together wireframes in a balsamic. I was like, whoa, okay, why did you hire us? <laughs> um, but no, our job was really to sort of take those deliverables and those ideas. Again, it was great that they had uh, strong opinions and uh, you know ways that they wanted it to work. But uh, what was really nice was for us to sort of take all those cards and start shuffling them around uh, in the messy middle and then come out with something that was, again, very focused and refined. And as I said, it's not really a typical site. We want to keep people engaged. We wanted to make sure that they were bouncing off quite quickly and then downloading the app. So uh, for us, it was really consolidating that strategy. And uh, yeah, to talk a bit more about the discovery process, what we actually wound up doing, we started with a couple of focus groups, which was great, because I said, who made these wireframes? Why did you make them like this? What do you think about this content? Uh, what are we actually trying to do? So we had sessions that were both together and separate with their IT team, uh, a lot of, again, uh, robust security requirements, and uh, as Simon will get into a bit later on. We talked to their leadership, who again, really making sure that vision, uh, really embodying uh, essentially that spirit of advocacy, activism, but also really primary healthcare services that uh, Planned Parenthood and Planned Parent Direct provide, and also with their marketing team. They talked a bit about wanting a, a younger, sort of a social media inspired aesthetic. Obviously, it's a, built to be a website, but very uh, mobile first. And uh, really just making sure we understood who are their target audiences and what was going to be important in terms of those needs, but also uh, the objectives of this organization, of the service. Uh, next up, we invested uh, a bit more heavily in user journey mapping because, again, we know that when someone's on a website, you don't have a ton of time to actually convert them. So it's really important to sort of see, okay, what is that sort of critical path or that flow? What information do I need to place at which point in the user path? And sort of take into consideration, maybe people are hearing about this on TikTok and they're saying, oh, great, I'm going to want to just jump and download the app right away. I'm already convinced. I know what's what versus those who maybe need a bit more information, haven't maybe used a virtual health services before, are wary about I know, signing up for something that's gonna start automatically renewing on my parents' credit card, and maybe I just wanna, uh, again, take a step back, get a bit more information before I jump over and convert. Um, so again, it was really important for us to look a bit more closely at uh, that target journey and consider all the different uh, entry points that our users might be using. And lastly, we did a bit of an audit of their ecosystem, because obviously Planned Parenthood Direct is sort of a subsidiary of the larger PPOL, so uh, the, uh, the organization that has been founded for over 100 years now. And uh, while there was definitely an interest in sort of uh, uh, reusing some of the great content that was being pushed out from the PlannedParenthood.org website, for instance, uh, more editorial style content and also great health information, whether uh, FAQs or sort of uh, inspirational content. 
The team didn't really want to start from scratch. Planned Parenthood Direct was very small. So they sort of said we'd love to be able to sort of syndicate some content, uh, whether it's news or blog articles, but at the same time, make sure that we sort of put our own spin on it and really have a seamless and, um, uh, let's say, uh, efficient experience for our content editors. Again, a very small team, so we wanted to make things uh, yeah, straightforward for them. Uh, so I wanted to talk a bit more about how we sort of moved from that initial strategy into the design phase. And uh, again, I like to start with user experience. It's really at the top of everything is user experience. And uh, walk you through a bit more some of the deliverables that we produced. So we had a really great uh, sort of interactive uh, uh, workshop. We tried to figure out uh, what are the needs uh, per different audience? How are we going to prioritize them? What is their journey? And really start sort of matching up what content do we have already? What content are we going to need? And uh, really making sure that we were uh, not jumping directly into wireframes, but walking back some of those decisions to make sure are we really optimizing this based on uh, what information our users are looking for and what they're trying to do. So once we had sort of uh, taken that, we really understood that as a user, I'm mostly interested in the service. Uh, is it the birth control I want? Is it uh, this type of antibiotic? And uh, so we want to sort of put that front and center. And this is what really drove the layout of the initial wireframe. So here we have the home page. We kept the calls to action uh, very prominent. Again, if you're coming from elsewhere, you can download right away. But right away, you can sort of say, oh, great, these are all the services that are provided. And uh, again, I just want to sort of modernize them a bit. If the service that I'm interested in is not available, uh, what was really great about the connection with uh, Planned Parenthood was to be able to say, hey, service that you're interested in not here, find a health center that's local to you and really push users directly to the Planned Parenthood website where they could then uh, look uh, via their zip code and find local health centers and see which services were provided. So a really great secondary call to action that, again, can really continue to build that uh, loyalty to the brand and ensure that at the end of the day were services for as many people as possible. Uh, after, if I find the service that I want, what's really important is to know, is it available in my state? So currently, Planned Parenthood Direct is available in 42 states, as well as in the District of Columbia. So it's a really nice coverage, too. And we worked really hard with our UX designer to sort of map out these different flows and really design for all options. So if I can see uh, that my state is one of those ones that is covered by PP Direct, we also put in a bit of the, the graphic to get the visual representation, but it was also very clear in the drop down too, uh, which states were sort of marked as uh, coming soon. Again, pushing our advocacy in there a little bit. Um, and again, what was really nice is to look at those secondary calls to action. If, for example, I'm in South Carolina, the services are not available yet, you can really enter your email address and be uh, notified right away. So again, creating that sort of uh, base that you can funnel into the overall mobilization efforts on behalf of citizens who should have access to services. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then uh, what was a really interesting um, um, design decision that I know uh, was uh, interesting technologically speaking as well, um, essentially it's mail order. So even if uh, services are maybe not available in my state or a specific service is not available in the state I'm in, but it's available maybe near to me, we decided to really make it super simple to toggle sort of through the different states and really see what was available where by actually integrating a drop down menu into the title of the page. And uh, it was really going along a bit with the mobile first experience in that uh, when things are reloaded, it was almost imperceptible to the user. So the content would be sort of updated, but uh, again, it gave a really uh, app sort of uh, ish uh, inspired uh, experience that again, we really hope was getting people closer to making that decision, great, this is right for me. And uh, after you find your service you need, it's available in the state where you are either located or can have access to. Uh, the next piece of information that people were looking for was how does it actually work? So I wanted to give people just enough details, not sort of overwhelm them with the sort of terms and services. And obviously, we're talking about um, a complicated legal context too. And Planned Parenthood Direct was obviously really on the hook to provide accurate and up-to-date information 
as you know things are being rolled out, uh, it was not even month to month, probably week to week uh, back in uh, uh, when everything was going on. So it was really a sort of bang, 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 one, two, three, what's happened very easy with a, a great content strategy from the Planned Parenthood Direct team to distill the sort of essential information. And again, we helped them design some of the iconography and uh, really that sort of very accessible and clear um, imagery that was really going to help them uh, understand very quickly, great, this is uh, going to be easy and simple and it's right for me. Uh, and again, to go back to the mobile first uh, approach, uh, what was really nice when we sort of uh, started designing the mobile screens first and afterwards we adapted them to desktop and we were actually able to make things even easier for the users by uh, using our technology to automatically recognize what device is the user visiting from to really only serve them uh, the appropriate uh, app store that would match uh, their device. So these sort of little tweaks that, again, our goal was really to remove any obstacles on that journey and uh, make things uh, super simple, super easy, and uh, yeah, help people convert. Uh, next, I wanted to talk a bit about the content model. So I didn't mention before, but my background is as a librarian, so I really like information and how I can organize it, how I can classify and like group things together. And the content model from uh, Planned Parenthood Direct was a really, really fun challenge that we designed uh, in tandem with uh, Don, our amazing uh, technical architect. So essentially, bringing it all together, um, we started with a pretty simple information architecture. Uh, it is a marketing website, not a government website, so fewer pages are right to the point. And uh, our first step after we sort of uh, laid out uh, the overall structure, translated it to navigation, was to really think about our content types. We went pretty simple. We had pages. Uh, we sort of knew we'd have a nice sort of template. And uh, again, the content editors could have a, a good experience to sort of add in the different components they needed. Uh, then we also looked at some content types that warranted a bit more of a structured approach. As we said, FAQs were going to be really important and making sure that we could really parse them at the smallest level, tag a given FAQ, this relates to birth control, whereas this uh, relates to UTI treatment. Same approach with the different articles, so this is the editorial approach they wanted to bring and make sure that, hey, maybe I'm looking at services here, maybe I also want to read um, how to pick the right birth control for you or whatever related content. Uh, same applies to the reviews as well as uh, the careers, which was a job listing type. So again, adding a bit more structure, but nothing overwhelming, and then incorporating some of those external resources just to make sure that their content team could say, hey, great, we had some really cool media coverage. I really quickly want to list this news article, add the URL, show a snippet. But again, no must, no fuss, because again, we have other things uh, keeping us busy. And uh, the last one I wanted to touch on are those terms or the taxonomies. And this is really at the heart of the content model too because as you started to see from the, um, uh, the concept, essentially we have our different states who offer different services and within those services we have descriptions and we also have much more detailed information uh, such as uh, how much will it cost me depending on what state I'm in, what is the delivery method, what insurance uh, options are available to me. Um, so yeah, with a really small team, uh, we tried to map it out a bit to sort of show, okay, services, you sort of see the text in there, uh, but quite quickly, uh, we were sort of getting to the point where it was like, oh God, how is a team of two going to keep all this information up to date, knowing that we can have new services added, services that are being removed, oh, the insurance went up from, uh, it was $25 copay, now it's 35 whatever the details were. And our goal was really to make that content editor and content management experience really easy and uh, efficient and ensure that, again, they were focusing their time on more important things. So rather than having something that was like, oh, God, how do I multiply that for California times the other 41 states where it's available, uh, we were just able to sort of modelize uh, the information in terms of what could be made generic or reusable. So in this case, uh, we had really uh, the service as a term, which had its name, a description that could be propagated across any uh, state page of the site. But then we did make certain information customizable, so that delivery cost and insurance really tried to give them a strong basis for this is just going to be plug and play add in the number, and essentially just really trying to isolate that which was really distinct so that the content editors could, again, focus their time on the right information. And uh, the last aspect uh, that was really exciting to work on too was uh, support. So they were coming from a model where they had a, a pretty uh, good team who was running an internal knowledge base and they had a whole form where you could add in a ticket and say, hey, anything from an issue with the service itself to something that was more related to the app. 
So I need to get my medication, now what should I do? Do I call uh, the USPS versus I forgot my password or my credit card information is not working, et cetera. And uh, because they had sort of uh, already sort of semi-structured their knowledge base, we were able to sort of say, look, the goal is that your team has other stuff going on. If we can reduce the ticket loan coming in and just make it a bit more, again, FAQ, self-service style, we already know that young people are probably loath to sort of say, I'm going to send an email into the void and wait for an answer when it's something as uh, critical as healthcare or someone who's in maybe a situation that, again, urgency is sort of uh, at top of mind. So we tried to make it uh, as uh, simple as possible with a new sort of FAQ and help. And rather than just sort of pushing out their generic FAQs, we actually started sourcing uh, information from their internal knowledge base tagging it with those same taxonomy terms and sort of structuring it that so we could really push out different things. And uh, yeah, we had different tags that would come up to learn and look at, is it about the app, is it about the service, is it about this particular service, et cetera. So another uh, great example of how our content model was really able to, again, do the heavy lifting for them. And uh, yeah, but with that uh, strategy design, it was great. How did we actually make it happen? And uh, obviously for this crowd too, uh, how did we align on Drupal as a B or part of the solution? So without further ado. <laughs> well, at that point, uh, you should be pretty convinced with all the work that was done in Discovery that Drupal is probably one of the best solutions in terms of content modeling in the open source ecosystem. So probably that punch the client had at the beginning was the right idea. But there were a couple of other uh, challenges in that project. First, we had three months, including the strategy and the design and the build. Their uh, internal team knew nothing about Drupal, nothing about Twig. The only thing that grid to web was their experience with React uh, on the front side. We held out, also had uh, interesting UI challenges, such as that drop-down integrating the title, like the, uh, the ability to not reload the page so that we don't break the, the, the user flow. And on top of that, they were re really concerned about the performance and the security aspect of that, because given the uh, heavy political nature of the topic, uh, they were sure there were um, hack attempts, like attempts to bring the website down, uh, but also they were willing to be sure that if ever they were featured in the news, uh, the website would be would, would survive that influx of traffic. So basically, they were willing to have a static website. Just like they were willing to have a CMS, but they're also willing to have a static website. So that really leads to what like decoupling, right? I mean, a uh, decouple, sort of a headless uh, decouple. Uh, I mean, you name it, headless decouple. That that's the same, right? It, it's new. It's been around like only about 15 years. So it keep, it keeps changing names, of course. Um, Got a disclaimer first. It's, the content is going to be pretty approachable, but I know people that love, there are some people that love to go a little bit more into detail, so uh, those slides are going to be flagged uh, accordingly uh, if, if needed. So first, like just, just to recap for everyone, a typical Drupal stack, like a typical website, you just your browser requests from a, request a page associated to a specific URL, gets the page, displays the page, story ends. Then it's it doesn't it doesn't change until there's a new click and then we go to another page. A web app, on the other hand, it's more like a, a living thing in your browser that interacts with the server not to fetch a page but to fetch data. So it requests data and then uses that data to build the content and put it uh, to put it uh, uh, on on the page and displays it on the page. So usually on that kind of architecture on the back end. Mostly, fine, like if, if you're in the, the, the PHP world, you'll find like Symfony-based uh, framework like, uh, application or Laravel application or sometimes not js based uh, framework, stuff like that. But picture for a minute that we use Drupal instead uh, on the back end. That's basically what decoupled Drupal is. We take Drupal for uh, what, it, what it's best at on the back end side. We pick a different framework, like a, a specific stack for the front end, and, and we have an API in between. So on that particular project, I mean, picking the right stack is always like one of the challenges of such projects. We we kind of explore different solutions, like such as such as solutions that are native to Drupal. Uh, some of them are uh, more opinionated. The major contender, contenders nowadays are uh, the, the the React based uh, solutions uh, like Next.js and the Vue.js based solutions such as Next.js. Gatsby is interesting, React based, but 
really, really opinionated and not necessarily very uh, leveraging all the good stuff that are in the Drupal world. And as I, as I said, the team on the client side has prior knowledge with React, so we settled on, on, on Next.js so that they could be more autonomous in the, in the maintenance. And also, it's really uh, um, interesting to note that Next.js is really like the, the front-end framework that, is the, the, that has the best support uh, for the integration with Drupal. Uh, that's uh, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, something that, that stands out. All right, what can we expect then when we, when we follow that route? Uh, a boost in performance for sure, because the, the Drupal stack is only going to have to provide data as JSON files and just serve the static assets that the content editor uploads uh, upload in, the, in, the, in the system. Um, scalability, because if we need a bigger, I mean, if ever we need a bigger infrastructure, but we, should, we shouldn't even need, we're just serving a static asset in the end. So, I mean, uh, it's going to be hosted on, on I mean, our friends at Pantheon are capable of doing that, but you could put that on, on Netlify, on Verso, or like any, any static hosting uh, a provider is going to do. And it's also something to expect in terms of the team that is going to work on that. You're going to need some back-end Drupal specialists, but you're also going to need front-end React specialists. Um, but in, in a way, sometimes it's actually easier in terms of sourcing, because it, on the market today, it's actually sometimes easier to hire uh, front-end developers that know React than front-end developers that know Drupal. Um, and there's a little bit of management costs associated with that, but we'll come to that later. Another thing interesting to note is that you'll get an, uh, a hardened Drupal, like a Drupal that is more secure, because basically you're just going to expose a JSON API endpoint, like an API endpoint to serve data and the files that were uploaded. You can pretty much lock down everything else, everything that the content editors need to access. You can either shut it down completely and turn it on only if there's a need to change the content, or you can keep it up because it has to be changed uh, all the time, but that portion can be locked down behind an IP whitelisting or geofencing to make sure that it can't be accessed from uh, foreign countries because all the content editors are located in a specific country. And an nicer aspect down the line is that by using that architecture, you open up your, uh, your um, uh, website to features that you find in a, a progressive web app world. So for example, um, um, so those are features that browsers know where they uh, exposed to uh, developers, but that's not necessarily easy to use when you, you do typical uh, typical Drupal development, uh, such as um, uh, offline features, such as the fact that the website can work if you have no connection, or leverage better notification system, uh, and so on and so forth. And that list keep, uh, that, that list keep growing. All right, so now we know a little bit more what uh, a decoupled stack is. Let's look at how we actually build uh, the Drupal side of things on that on that project. So I put together a little like grocery list of what we need, we needed to like take care of, and we'll want to go go over some of those uh, some of those aspects. So first, I mean, Adrian uh, explained us all the content types and all the terms and everything we had we, we needed to, to create. But basically, in the end, it's just like the, the typical Drupal site building work. You just create your content types through the UI. Drupal is going to generate the config of those content types in the, the code base, but it, there's no code to write, you just export that, right? And on the front end side, the React devs, they're just, instead of producing tweak templates for those content types, they're just going to write React components with the tools they're used to. Same, same story for the paragraph types for the, the, the page building experience. We're gonna create all the paragraphs that the content editors are gonna use. Um, Drupal is going to automatically provide the config exports that we could deploy, those, uh, de deploy that configuration. And on the React side, same thing. Instead of tweak templates for those paragraphs, we're going to just build uh, React components using the standard React uh, tools. I want to touch down on something that is a little bit more technical, which is you're building a React app that lives in the browser, but your content has to be addressable by URLs that make sense, URLs that have a good SEO, uh, uh, SEO scoring and, and you can share. But if you if you know a little bit about Drupal, you know that, for example, slash pulse in that example, which is the URL of the, let's say the article page, might actually just be an alias for the node number 43, for example. And then if you're building the app, you, you don't really care about the fact that that's URL. What you need is the data associated to that node. So you need to make an API request to Drupal. And on top of that, you don't care about the 43. You need the UUID of the node. So like a lot of steps that you need to do on the front-end side to 
interact with Drupal and get uh, all that information. And then in the end, the, the, the front end is capable of rendering the page. Fortunately, there is actually a module that exists that provides that, like a, a, a turnkey solution for that when the front end app, be a React app or anything really, just ask Drupal, what the hell is that slash pulse URL? And then gets an answer that tells everything. So basically, it's not the home page, which is an important information. It's, it's a node. The type of the node is page. The ID is that. The UUID is that. And even better, it also provides the actual URL that the app needs to call to get the data associated to that page. What about site building now? So on the back end side of things, it's the usual content editing experience. The content editor are going to put together those paragraphs in the order they want. But on the front end, we want those to be rendered in the right order, and so on and so forth. So technically speaking, it's just a map, really. We have the list of all the, the entity types, if you will. So for all the node types and paragraph types, we're going to associate those with the name of the React component. And even if it looks scary, it's just a loop. Here you see basically the template, the component of a page that is built with paragraphs. And what happens is just, just a little loop that's going to loop over all the paragraphs. And for each one, it's going to query the map that we just saw and create the to that entity component that we see here, in, invoke and instantiate the right component so that we have all the components in the right order with the right data. Another aspect that's interesting is managing the menus. The last thing we want is to bury the menu configuration in the app and get a call on the Friday afternoon because the order is not right or there's an immediate need to shut down one of the section or to add a new one or whatnot. Drupal has a powerful menu management system so we want to use that. And fortunately enough, again, there's a country that through JSON API exposes the whole menu structure so the application can just query that, get the whole hierarchy, and dynamically build that in the app. So there's no need to get back to the developers to just do that simple management of the, what, what I consider part of the content itself, not, not the code. Sorry. Another nice aspect of that build is that we take over the view aspect of a node, and instead of rendering the node as if it would be a Drupal page, um, that tab remains in the admin side of thing and just plant an iframe that is going to call the React frontend and give that content editor a nice, nice preview of the work that just, uh, that just did on the edit side. So that's great, but so far, that it's, it's still a dynamic application that still needs to query Drupal every time there's a need to load a page. So how do we build the static artifact out of that? So the Next.js framework comes with a nice comment, just like next build, and everything's integrated in terms of gathering the list of all the URLs that com compose the page, the, 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 all the pages of the web type, basically, fetch everything that's needed, persist that as a set of static files, and then you have a shiny, nice artifact that you can just put on a static uh, hosting environment, um, but once again, you don't want to have to call the, the devs each time you do a modify. Like, hey, can you run that next uh, next build every time uh, you change a typo or or you add a new page? Um, there's a module for that also. See the pattern? Module for that. Uh, because what we want really is to expose just a button to the content editor, the content editor or content admin, like someone that has a little bit of more superpower to say, okay. Content's ready in the admin, we're going to put that in production. Um, and that's going to invoke your build system that you're going to put in your internal CI CD, such as a GitHub CI or GitHub Actions or whatnot, or, or even some um, hosting providers such as Pantheon actually offer that directly built in their uh, hosting stack. And what's going to, what, what's going to, what it's going to provide is basically a button that is exposing the UI to say, okay, content's ready, I'm just going to click on that and then it's going to trigger a rebuild on my front end. And a nice aspect of that is that the module is capable of actually tracking all the nodes that were changed or created since the last deploy. And then the content editor team can just go and check them one after the other in a preview mode to make sure that everything's OK before uh, uh, clicking that button. So let's give you an overview of how Drupal is capable of handling what we know it is capable to handle, the content model and the content editing experience, but also the integration with an external front end stack. So what's next? So first, there is a secret that I only tell my favorite people. 
But if you're in that room, you're definitely part of my favorite people, so I'm going to tell you that secret. Um, there's an equation that I call the headless equation, which is going to be weird if you're really a math pe like a math uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, person, which is one project equals two projects. <laughs> really, um, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. Sometimes it's like it's really easy. You just like you don't have any front end to do on Drupal. You just have front end to do on, on React. But in terms of different people you need to put together, different interactions, stuff like that. You really want to take that in, into consideration for the most complex project, you can actually double the budget of the project. For a project like that, I'd say it's more like maybe one or five times the price, because uh, as opposed to a, a, a static, a static, uh, a fully Drupal project, if you, if you will. But you want to take care of your uh, project manager mental health, right? They need to be prepared for that. So all in all, on the Drupal side, we saw that with a bunch of existing contributors, we're capable of implementing everything we need on the backend side. And in terms of custom code that we need to add for that to be working well, does not. There's basically there's literally we, we had to write like zero line of code to build the Drupal side of that of that project. It was only like the, the, the gist of it is really the React app that's built upon uh, Next.js and the, the really impressive work of the, the Drupal Next project. Um, that is available to open source on, on Drupal.org. Um, which basically leads to another secret that I'm going to share right away, don't worry. Right now, I think we can all say that because there's no need for any custom modules, Drupal is really no, it has become a no code headless CMS, which is really for the win. Uh, because it can really now start to compete with commercial solutions that, that are, I don't know, full of content, for example. I've heard that one. <laughs> So that basically summarizes how we were capable of helping Plan Parent Direct to put it all together as a decoupled stack, addressing their needs in a couple of months. Three, in fact, three months was the target. I think we nailed it uh, almost. And then if you want to see the results, I mean, the PlanParentDirect.org is up and live since a couple of months already. So I think, yay, we can all be proud of what we've been able to promote. Uh, as a topic, as a technical uh, realization. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, we're happy to, to help. Uh, yeah. So, what modules were used for uh, making the website accessible and also implement location and multilingual support? So, the multilingual support uh, was initially planned but deferred because they want the, the website to be, I think, translated in Spanish at some point. It's yeah, happening. it was discoped. It was discoped initially, but it's going to come. Um, on the Drupal side, you don't need anything because Drupal like, natively provides uh, everything you need. On the backend side, it's just about making sure that when the developers are fetching the content, they put the right prefix in the JSON API queries so that they query the content in, in the right language. And then they can infer what language they're in by looking at the URL. So it's, there's a little bit of um, uh, heavy lifting to do on the front end side. Say, so, okay, I'm going to look at the beginning of the path. If, if, it's, uh, if it's EN or if it's ES, then gather the language and then query the data according it. So there's, on the Drupal side, there's no need for anything. For location and accessibility also. So accessibility, that's something that, that that's one of the, um, let's say, the few drawbacks that we have. Is like if you go in decoupled, you basically lose all the nice stuff that comes free in Drupal in terms of accessibility, SEO, meta tag management that you basically have to re-implement uh, on the front end side, more or less. Um, so yeah, but basically, if your team is already aware of that, when they build the Drupal front end, they, they just need to do the same thing when they're building their React components, and, and, and that's OK. But, yeah. 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 One asking question on Geo, if there's any Geo lookup in, in the app, I don't know. I don't think there was any need for any geo lookup. Uh, but it was geo fence because for a while yeah. we did not have access to it because we were in Canada. <laughs> so it was like a bit of a. There was some geo fencing for security reason because the rationale was that the website, there was no, no, no need for the website to be accessible outside the US. So to avoid any potential threat, to just lock it down and from, from the outside world, basically. So they all love Canada, but we're a friendly country. So that's <laughs> You mentioned three months. Yeah. As, as a timeline, what, what, I can't imagine what? the entire project timeline was three months. Was, was that like, like 
information architecture to deployment was like what what was the three month timeline? I'm curious because that sounds fast. Well, how much time do you think you spend on that? I mean, everything happened quite fast. They had a pretty tight deadline. I'm pretty sure, as usual, it was extended a tiny bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, but roughly three months start to finish. It was weird. also easier because there weren't a lot of people to consult. Yeah. It was really, we had direct access to the CEO, the marketing head. To deal with. And yeah, that's it. Like, it wasn't sort of like this yeah. and that. And again, it was a very, maybe, I know art direction, you wanted to source with photography, but it was details. Like yeah. uh, nothing that prevented, I think, the tech team from like, and on the tech team, we on, on the tech team we get like one super strong backend guy, one super strong front guy. They were able to kind of pull it through very fast uh, in order to avoid that back and forth. And like it's like yeah, we're gonna fully look at you. You're gonna do that fast. Um, yeah, I mean, but it looks impressive. But the website really is, uh, is, is, is simple. It's, it's and, just and then project that somebody asked me, like, can you do this in three months? I would have been like, well, <laughs> no, as I, I mean. We have been doing those decoupled architecture for the last 15 years. Yeah, started with Drupal 6. Um, but uh, I'm still baffled by the fact that you don't have anything. You, there's nothing to do on the Drupal side. Yeah. So it's just about building a React app, Next.js, and three months be becomes a little bit realistic if you think about it. Just uh, uh, I love to hear that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Did you do any type of user testing before launch? And if so, like, what does that look like? No, we didn't do anything uh, prior, and again, it was one of those things where uh, we scanned through and made sure everything was working correctly, loading the correct information, but uh, to be very honest, I don't even know, like, it was really the state selector and uh, the main information pages, but uh, I think uh, the whole Pulse article section are, like, not critical, like, it was a very nice sort of MVP approach, and uh, have you heard anything in terms of uh, updates uh, since launch? It was a quality maintenance. Thing. What, what's uh, what's interesting is so multilingual support is coming, and I think what they have in mind right now there's a couple of uh, e-commerce e related stuff that are going to be kind of interesting to implement because it's those are simple needs and we're going to be able to tackle that just on the front end side. It's just like it's, Drupal will be involved because we need to present those products, we need to capture the editorial aspect of it, but then we can just integrate the checkout experience of the third party. Uh, like a Stripe or, or PayPal checkout or something like that. Yeah, but the client was very comfortable with a quite new process there, so they said, okay, if it's three months, it's three months. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, no extras. And, and at some point, their internal team also jumped on it because they are also experienced React app developers, so they're also involved in the maintenance aspects. We're merely there to support for more the Drupal side of like applying security upgrades and making sure that we. Uh, like when they want to implement something, they ask us like, oh, they need to invoke the JSON API thing and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm sorry I said this. Is there authentication in there? Like, or do you use, is it just like a getting information kind of a thing? Do users actually log in? No. Yeah. Okay. So okay. There, there's no authentication on the front and side, only on the back and side sure. when it comes to the user, yeah. yeah.